Meanwhile, I shared a wonderful Chinese proverb. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And hardly anybody knows that there's a fourth sentence, step back and I will act. So on, on, on teaching stuff and gu guide me until I can, can walk on my own. <laughs> no, no, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and whereas, you know, a lot of our, actually a lot of our teaching is, is sort of becomes a performative exercise. If you, you know, if you can go through the, you know, if you can mimic the motions you see in front of you, that's a tick. Yeah. Um, uh, and, well, always in the background, the sense that any mistake I make is somebody else's problem, you know, fault and problem to resolve. And I sort of, I, I find it sad because it's, it's not because I, th I think ill of others because I am one of them. <laughs> So I said, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as it. But it's just a sense that, mm, yes, well, you know, somebody's got to sort it out. So if, if even if all of us just did one thing. You know, <laughs> so what are you working on at the moment? Uh, let me think where to go. Well, the, the, the chronoscope, of course, involves me a lot. And I'm I'm diving away from maps. And I wonder how any kind of uh, digitized materials can and should be uh, visualized. That's one idea that really should resonate between the two of us, because you once mentioned to kind of republish the Ted Nelson papers that are papers and not books. Yeah. And so what I already have, of course, is uh, visualizing lots of maps on the world map. And I can also visualize a, a stack of papers on the same spot at world coordinates zero zero that doesn't make much sense but there i don't have any distortion so that's why i use this cartesian point south of ghana yeah uh, in the atlantic to to have my my clean canvas and no the, island no, no island wonderful blue background or whatever sub backgrounds very neutral it's, it's a very an empty canvas down there mm. and so I'm, I'm 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 thinking about the idea to have some kind of semi-automatic spreading and shuffling of Ted Nelson's papers, for example, because if it's a, a volume of 20, 30, 50, 90 pages all on top of each other, mm -hmm. just arbitrary pushed there, it doesn't have, well, any kind of, of spatial meaning. So what oh, if... I've seen your page that does sort of random quotes of his, I think. Yeah, yeah, really, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the initial... Yeah parking points where all this or ignition points where all this might well start eventually mm -hmm. when I can say this was the starting point but having some some algorithms to lay out um, internet archives books in a way that no other tool does yet because no other dual tool does it right so if you open in pdf you have what fits on the screen and you have these endless uh, toilet paper layout of little sheets and it's 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 different all over and over again once you have a different window size so it, it, it doesn't really helpful to support your spatial memory there mm. with something well it's mm. funny that the, the different yeah. the spatial memory be, between yeah. the paper yeah uh, and the fact that if i'm they're almost you know i'm lucky i have two screens but I, for instance I, i'd like to have the paper almost on one side the paper representation but the other side is something in a, a really comfortable to read font size Okay, that just yeah. scrolls, you know, and okay. I can do set, digital text search on, um, which is almost a complete different experiential thing to the reading. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, open bracket, side remark. Once I start a new article, I, I set my font size to 800 pixels because with one word, my screen is full. Yay, I have accomplished something. <laughs> and then I... I I, I, I scale down my, my writing font down to, down to, down to, until I really have one paragraph on yeah. my screen. So that's really my, my, my hidden secret. So don't, don't <laughs> my, my big I, idea is to, 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 to circumvent the um, anxiety of the blank paper. Yes. <laughs> um, back to the chronoscope and triple IF and, and paper. So, and your, your jigsaw example, moments ago so if you have something you don't understand and my what was it begreif and to touch something mm. i want to shuffle the papers so that i haven't understood yet around on a kind of canvas 
tabletop to see, well, the, these match, this is the order, this is important, this is a real dog ear without going into skeuomorphism and see, this, this is how I understand this yet unknown oeuvre of someone who has written anything, let it be Ted Nelson or Mozart or whatever. So, um, and, and, and as far as I know, there's not really a tool to, to go into our heritage and the, the, the scanned material from archives and to really mark those stuff in a meaningful way for the researcher itself. And this is something I, I'd like to, to dive deeper into this direction. I don't care yet on, on 3D and virtual reality and augmented reality. Fancy stuff is possible and much more attention would come if I have the goggles on, on my head. But the, the, the underlying problem is how do I understand something that's there, but that haven't I that, that's not printed yet. So go, go going away from the paper world into the digital world and uh trying to well, what's the word to 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 understand, to grasp, to uh really deeply understand what's there and to find the connections between different authors. Mm. Um, so it's, it's it, it might be Ted Nelson, but he has a reference to someone else I don't know yet. So I find something on the Internet Archive and I have in this very moment a link between the two because I, I have the idea, the glimpse of an idea that I understood something yeah. uh, like the two neurons from from Freud moments ago. And so I, I'd like to, to capture this spark of an idea to really go back to this and, and contribute to, to, to this if I ever encounter a similar situation of two related stuff that reminds me on this one from uh, Melville Monday yeah. years ago I know how to retrieve this data and it's still there and I can attach new insights to this original connecting the dots thing and uh, well this is really a grand and abstract idea I'm not really working on that but I'm I always find myself coming back to this idea how to to connect um and 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 cross reference documents from from our wonderful literature and science and and music uh, societies now that's interesting I, something that just flashed through my mind is you were talking about um the sort of mapping from effectively older documents to other things is um because it's, it's actually someone it's it's a group in germany someone i think at the university of mainz is doing well what they're calling um offset metadata but you know it's essentially hypertext linking mm -hmm. because it's, it's it's based off character it's based off uh runs of characters but um it's being rediscovered by people because if you only know a web page, well, you can't have overlapping anchors. Well, yeah. this is this is basically what it is. And I know it's been done sort of, I mean, I know the British Library do stuff like this because when you have multiple manuscripts, you know, you often want to be able to show that actually this word has moved slightly or it's changed. Yeah, but yeah. but the, the guys, there's a chap, he's actually based in Australia, but he's working with a group in a German university. And I'll, I, I, I'll, when I'm not sort of talking about it, I'll try and dig it up and send you a link. But um, there's a app they call it sort of codex, but essentially in this case they're using JSON as back end. I don't, does it really matter? I, to a yeah. certain, if it if it works, I, I I'm I'm not too worried. But but it is it's it's very interesting in that the people doing it understand it's about very nuanced, um, effectively metadata mapping. Yes, um, I'm involved in the IIIF community, and of course there's lots of of transcriptions and annotations. Yeah. And you start with the scanned paper and say, well, I can't read this word. I do an annotation, a little uh, square around this unknown word and have my annotation, what it might mean and so on. And this is shared between all the researchers. So this this is uh, going on already, but it's it's still page oriented and not book or volume oriented. So it, it, it really goes beyond grasp. Mm. You have multiple authors multiple um, libraries and, and try to get hold of what you just understood by spreading out the idea on your table or your yes. table. <laughs> yeah and and um, I mean th this is why this is why I was <laughs> I guess, so, so annoyed about the fact that you know what people overlook with a PDF is it was solving a printing problem. Yes. Paper and that's you know that's and which is why even with a modern tool, it's actually quite hard to get a clean extraction of the body text. Yeah. It doesn't have page numbers. And yeah. I mean, I did, 
again for well we, we, we it was to for some machine learning that didn't happen when i did the analysis of the the hypertext conference I, I got all the papers and I, I did a plain text extraction what was really frightening is at least somewhere between 12 and 15 percent um had it's a really severe corruption so the classic things you get which are something to do with the acr process is that either all the letters are run together and there are no spaces or all the letters have a space in between and i understand there's a whole area of academic research now that's involved in basically trying to resolve this you know rather than not have the problem in the first place which which sort of says to me you know just just the knots we tie ourselves in the true story how i virtually met ted nelson uh, i was kind of jet lagged in in the states and he put some of his books um yeah. in, in a very weird Scan format. Uh, yeah, that's the thing you get. To get my. I, I, I was saying it has feature information. Yeah, but I want to flip through it. That goes a little bit deeper. Me zoom preferences, background. That's the second video. Uh, that's the blurry thing. I don't get it. Background and effects. None. There we yep. go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know this one, and um, as a as a reference to what I, I meant a couple of seconds ago. So always, you know, this yes. wonderful, yeah. wonderful sketches. So this this is a printout of what Te what Ted Nelson put online those days in a very weird scan format or fax format. It was a, what a scan fax format. And I transferred this document into a PDF. I sent an email to him. Hello, Ted. I love your books. I love your reasoning. I love your yeah. everything. And by the way, if you want to share your books as PDF, here it is. I did it for you for free. Yeah. Um, I got a response. Hey, I was young. Hey, and he said, "Thank you, Matthias. I wanted to have nothing to do with PDF at all because <laughs> they they did it absolutely wrong." And it's it's, it's, it's 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 my words right now. It's a sandwich format of yeah pixel and some very weird uh, OCR text. Yeah. And sometimes it's a real ASCII, but you can get it out of the PDF mm -hmm. and. Off, you have some some boxes of actions of, of hyperlinks that do something but nothing really cool and right he was right um i had a lesson to share years later to root to you right now but but since then um well how do we do it better than pdf pdf you're absolutely right is a kind of software printer that that's true everything that's there can be shared it can be emailed but it's dead you can't get anything out of the pdf again um but but there's no no alternative and I don't defend PDF right now. There's no alternative that that builds on top of HTML or a PDF to really be a dynamic hypertext format uh, for the sake to support groups like us, like the future of text. Well, the, this is a problem. We have Nobody access rights. We have versioning. We can do the connection lines, do little asterisks, yeah. bottom caveats, and yeah. the uh, and, and the margins, and so on, and say, well, this this is how I understand this documents this is my view into the common corpus of future of text and from there on we can develop new ideas together and say well this this is our latest and best knowledge on the subject of course we develop these ideas further in the future but for timestamp december 2024 this is it the next volume and so on well Notice. that's why i think the the sort of the standoff metadata or whatever we're calling it now i i think is you know it's sort of time it's time has come yeah yeah funny enough you talking about things that you know i i would love to actually have a digital copy of this <laughs> the number of times i've gone through and i'm thinking i know the quote i want and i thought i'd put a flag on the side or something but no. um Poss possiplex is is very genius in the sense how ted nelson does the indenting yeah yeah, it's 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 really cool because you can read really the 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 not indented paragraphs in sequence, and it's a perfect story. And yeah. if you want to go deeper, you go to the next level yeah. of indent. So it's, it's and it's, it's lovely. Awesome. It's a writer who has no lack of confidence, and I love all you know. What would so and so have said? You know, <laughs> but I, I I mean I do. That's why it's actually fun. Enough, that's one reason I was I was actually quite interested in maybe talking to uh, Dini's group about doing something with literary machines because she basically teaches a yeah 
Te teachers are media uh, course. So they're, they're, you know, they're trying to do um, multimedia and stuff. Um, so there's, like, there's quite a diverse range of talents, which is always a good, which I like to see. So when I was, you know, lots of people with non-overlapping talents, always a good sign. Um, and, you know, thinking, okay, what we can make of it. Because for instance, you could take, so, I mean, I've got the, I've got the 87.1 of, of that. Um, I, I do know, well, you, yes, and I have, I, I, the, the, the thing that I digitize, the, the difference funnily enough, between that and this one is as far as I can work out, only the preface. Okay. Because in your book, um, the reason this all started, here's, you know, this is a bit like your thing with Ted. The reason this all started for me is I was trying to, I got to be in my bonnet that I wanted to, 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 to give a proper citation of the word transclusion. Yeah. The first place it turns up is in the unnumbered preface to 93.1 as a footnote when he says when i you know I, when i used inclusion what i should have said was um and it's it you know but it's delightful and that's sort of in but but again that to me was quite a damascene moment saying okay this is how broken our sort of citation thing is because i was looking at what people were citing for this and thinking, oh, that's not right yeah, yeah. um and then think well it's partly not right because who's got a copy of the book Unless you're lucky, I don't know if you know you were you, you might not have been privy. Adam Wern, who's here earlier, um, he got a copy of this for a dollar from his local library who are throwing it out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the, the whole impetus for me of sort of doing that was because I'd um, someone had, I, I that's what I was trying to reference something was when I was running this down because I didn't it wasn't in my book, someone sent me a uh, a PDF of the 93.1 thing and I scanned it got the text out and I you know had that that sort of late night thought you know actually you could tidy this up and turn this into html and then when I got I got a copy of this and I can't remember a site a, a conversation with Ted anyway he kindly sent me another copy because I didn't want to send this off because I, I found a place in Romania in fact it cost more to courier to Romania than it did to have this um scanned without you know without having the Thing cut off because these are hard to find and um that was interesting and it came back i got a nice sort of pdf and rtf and all sorts of it came back in an epub3 form mm -hmm. um which of course was, had all sorts of errors and i cleaned that up i thought oh wait a minute mm. so i did that, that that was how i came to do the same for literary machines and it sort of rested there um the really interesting thing going to your point about you know how these things live together is one of the things I rapidly found is okay, so ebooks aren't really designed for footnotes. Yeah. A, a bit of text, a paragraph, you know, certainly not a page long or something with diagrams in it. No. Um, running headers and footers. I mean, chapter two of Literary Machines is a bravura thing in terms of layout because it has running heads. It, well, it has a sort of running title and then it has almost running footnotes because they just, uh, I mean, they're not intention. It's mainly they they run because they're long, but you end up with each. I think it's chapter two. Each page almost has three segments. You know, the the the, the top effectively is like a sort of run on header. The bottom is the the footnotes, some of which are quite long, flowing along, and then there's the main copy in between. Um, trying to do that in strictly in ebook form, it's not there, but it's not that it can't be done. Because once you've actually got the semantic markup for the structural elements, you know, the, the effectively the paragraph blocks, um, it's totally actionable to make it whatever you want. I mean, I, I don't have I don't have the coding skills to do it, but it, you know, this is why I thought it'd be fun to give it to a bunch of people who sort of would know how to do that. So, okay, so you know, what are the different variations? Well, for instance, one is that it would be nice to just have literally the whole of the, effectively the run of the text. I mean, one thing I haven't tried to do, I haven't done so far, is to try and um, annotate, fully annotate the text of the diagrams, because um, Ted's writing is like a form of crypto, <laughs> especially when he has a habit of writing off the page, edge of the page he photocopied, <laughs> which happens around a lot in his notes. Um, yes, I made the mistake of asking him once, uh, uh, you know, about that and got a rather testy reply, and I wouldn't remember, and I thought, well, you wrote it, you know, so. I have a little 
idea to share right now hold on a second or just continue talking sure. yeah oh by the way yeah you're absolutely right it was um the the, the thing hard and fast thoughts there's just a lovely bit about three quarters of the way through where the audience are all laughing and he's just saying why not yeah and i'd love to know what they were laughing at <laughs> i i found um something from 1966 but it's very unlikely that this is exactly the piece that you were looking for no, no, the, the, the hard and fast thoughts, that it, that's a bit of audio, if I yeah. recall. Yeah, no, that audio, it's, it's in there, and it's towards the end, because I listened to it, I'm oh, basically, okay. cool. um, with Dave Millard, my supervisor, well, we, we'll see if it gets accepted, we, we've basically written a, a, a sort of retrospective, it's, well, it's called The Seven Hypertexts, but it's sort of, you know, it, it, it grew out of our, uh, his interest in sort of the way it's gone off in different areas. So, and my my permanent annoyance about meeting another group of people who tell it who tell me who tell me they've just invented what actually turns out to be hypertext. Yeah. <laughs> and that sense of just read some of the history. Um, uh, but but it was, it was I was looking at some of the early stuff, and I, I I'm just constantly blown away by you know. So there you are in the sort of mid '60s, and just actually, and although although. It's, it wasn't a fully formed thought. Absolutely, you can see lots of things that we were going to do that people were still saying, not only couldn't be done, but shouldn't be done because, well, for whatever reason, but we always say that when confronted by something new. I have other examples, but this is something that came into my mind right now. So um, we had a big fire in Hamburg in 1842. Mm -hmm. We had to rebuild our downtown city. And this is a map that shows something, but actually it is an interactive map. So if you hit the little Selena icon on top or the E key on your keyboard, you get a different edition of the same map Yeah. by, by flapping the flap. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you have some, some I don't know, um, attachments to Ted Nelson's papers, because you have some sheets on top of these other staples together, then you can simply, without losing the context, uh, see what's underneath there. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, another thing that sort of falls out from what you were saying in terms of having these collections of papers is that, you know, it's it, it it it's almost rather sort of digital humanity thing, but but being able to sort of basically trace the thought, the genesis of an idea, yeah. Um, where often the word may never, the idea may never be on the paper, yeah. stated in those terms. But you say, well, no, no, wait a minute. There, there's this that leads to that, and I mean, you you might say why, but the answer is well, you don't really know, and it's all. It's part of that sort of scholarship where the point is the point is not to ask why, the point is to do it, because you won't know until you get to the end. Yeah. It won't be time wasted. It, it, it may not be massively insightful, but if you don't try, you don't find out. No, that's yeah. lovely. I like the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of, maps just, maps do it for me. I have far too many books and maps. <laughs> um, I suppose we're, we're, we're I mean, I, I don't know what the, I mean, I, I, I don't know what your, what the sort of you know if you want to go and buy a map is there a sort of national we we, we here have the wonderful ordnance survey who've been sort of <laughs> well like all these things it was mainly so we could we could fire our artillery accurately at the french which started in about 1810 but since then certainly most of you know it started just in mainly in southern england but by the mid 1800s or something they'd done the whole of, of uk and it, it's really really accurately mapped uh, and pretty much sort of everything is there. So, because um, it always blew me away when the first time I went to the States and I tried to buy a local map. Um, and should people look at you blankly? Um, or being in Italy where I tried to buy a map because you're on a cycling holiday and someone said, well, we don't use maps. So what do you do? We well, just ask a local. You either know or you are somebody looking at me as if I was a complete fool. And I, at the time, the only map I could buy was some Soviet um, um, satellite mapping. I don't know if you have you seen any of those maps. So the, after the end of the um, after the fall of the sort of um, Warsaw Pact, they sort of began to come out. So they were done done for the Russian military, but they're actually rather wonderful. The sad thing is, they would tend to be done on awful paper. Um, <laughs> there, there is a 
book i should have taken me a while to to bring it to mind actually all about it but you know they they they, they thought about things like you know the um the weight the bridges would carry you know can you drive a tank over this bridge or not <laughs> Uh, and things like um, the rail lines in in ports were very very accurately mapped. <laughs> How to get your stuff off a ship into the nearest, you know. Uh, so, so it was done with a purpose. But um, there are and they're actually the sort of the the typography, the the cartography is, is also yeah. rather nice. I like to share a link that you will really love, and we are up to the hour. So this is the on and survey of Scotland. Uh, I put some time into it, and it was an exercise for me to, well, to deal with more than just one map, because the context really appears if you have lots of maps together. And uh, going back to Ted Nelson, just imagine that these are not subsections of Scotland, but subsections of literary machines mm. that are sorted by, by chapter, and you can dive in and annotate and have some uh some some cross references as flying airplanes from one page to the other this this is my my dream country is well when i made the comment earlier and again I, i'm not sure you joined is when adam was showing his visualization of the moby dick stuff and he had these sort of lines and i think oh right so this idea that you could have narrative trains yes. di different different lines of thought through it map yes. map map through it um because I mean, in a sense, on one level, they are just a visualization that rests on. I mean, the, the, the pivot point is the annotation, the annotation, the mapping and the annotations of the text is the, is is the sort of is the single point of failure in it. Um, but a lot of these things, in a way, individually are solved problems. Um, it's it's partly getting, you know, someone to sort of resource it a bit. Um, because it, you know, it, there is quite a lot. You know, there's a, there's a lot to do. One can do this, you know, in, in in on one's own in the dark hours of the night, sort of thing. But you know, to to, to make something really stand up and fly, because often um, you'll get corners of it. That some of the visual parts probably to make them really really fun. You know, may take quite a lot of people working on it just to get it just so. Um, because otherwise, if you're doing it all yourself and you start with that bit. You never yeah. get actually all the important stuff done. Um, I actually have some annotations. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm describing my, my, my dream country, but uh, it's already there in a sense. So this is the same as before, but the little icons are kind of annotations already. They don't scale. It's just for me. It's JSON coding, but you have the little cam icon and the little photo icon, and they have some meaning on top of these area for Scotland, for instance. And Eventually, this might evolve into a feature that not just me, but others can also put annotations on. Again, the uh, the literary machines once it's it's been laid out, and you see where people are have have most annotations or most most interest to discuss certain areas, and then they can flock together and say, "Well, this this is the the point where we meet on chapter three, page five, and I put my initial thoughts there already with little stickers and." Uh, go from there so what's in also interested actually in I, i'm looking at your very I, abstract I, sense i'm done already <laughs> <laughs> no no i i'm looking at your version with the with the overlay on on scotland and it occurs to me there's another area this is quite interesting is where you have um sort of books of historical travels for places we have mappings for yeah is um or you have something like Cobbett's rural rides in england or something yes, and yes, i'm yes. sure there must be people who said you know rode all the way around germany in the 18th mid 1800s or something where you can actually you can actually see the annotation so the, the, and this is probably the sort of map that they might be looking at so this was this was in a sense the perspective the the this was the abstract of, 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 um, perspective that was available to them at the time because otherwise we'd be looking at google maps and that's not not really quite the same thing hi fabian i'll um well hi again Sorry, Matthias has been showing me lots of uh, cool map stuff. Well, it's in the it's in the sidebar, anyways. <laughs> yes, I, I was starting to scroll through the sidebar, uh, and I was like, no, I should not because <laughs> there is already too much. It's like the, the conversation earlier this morning. Can't hold it all. The thumbs, and now I, I stop posting such links. <laughs>
Uh, um, I said to make a grab of it. This is for going back to our conversation. This is this is for um, Matthias. Going back to our conversation about PDFs. I, I've just uploaded it in the. Uh, oops, I press send in the in the in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes i had that i had that in a big poster over my desk in the lab when i was when i was researching and when it um when i moved i i don't know if i don't know if it, it anyone so sort of caught it so i had to i had to move all my stuff so i said i left a small block saying you know the one of those ones they have in the museum said this exhibit has now moved to that i noticed the odd person sort of walk up and look at So uh, you get something in response. Where do we go? Oh. Fabian, should we get headsets ready? Ooh. I'll get mine in a minute. Matthias, uh, do you have a headset available? No, I don't. Don't worry, there'll be one from Apple in a month that you will absolutely want. Okay, thank you. I check my mail. if my battery is. So um, for my side, you won't need a headset. If you have one, you can try it, kind of to prove that it's real, even though it's virtual. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it because as you can imagine, it's, I mean, it's usually already pre-experimental. This is as, fresh as it comes since it worked four minutes ago. Uh, but I don't, don't think a headset is required to to get the point, I hope. Well, with my level of, of coordination, I'll probably merely clear my desk of all objects. I might try with that for the moment and come back later. Yeah, and I, I go all the way to the having it in the headsets also because uh, I've been burned a few times where I knew, I knew it would work as expected in the headset, and of course it is not expected, and there is some like completely silly things like uh, security uh, limitations. Which is not silly in, in every context, but when you're experimenting, it's absolute absolute waste of time. Uh, but here it's okay. But by the way, Andrea, in terms of uh, logistics, you know if if. Did you have the time to discuss with Borg? Uh, is he coming? Uh, will you have time to be too late? I, I did not say talk okay. anything. Considering that we only have really two proper VR prototypes today, I think it would be a good use of our time to revisit Andreas. Uh, but maybe we do Fabian's now talk that through and then we do Andreas in that context so we get double context is that cool yeah unboxing for the first time in a couple of weeks <laughs> so uh, so yes I'll, I'll show you uh, I am happy because it, it literally worked seven minutes ago uh, it might not be useful it might not make sense but I I am rather convinced it, it is a useful step so uh, to give back a little bit more context, uh, the goal here uh, was to say uh, play or work with the content across all different devices. Uh, so of course, let's say a mobile phone, VR headset, uh, e-ink device, uh, 
game console. Uh, some things that I haven't done yet, but should, I mean, in theory, it kind of works ish, uh, like 360 camera, uh, AR monocle, a uh, bunch of different devices. I show them because the point is literally uh, to bring all those together, uh, even though there might be different uh, vendors, operating system. Uh, completely different modalities also to, uh, to get the content from them. Um, one of the goals that uh, I did not really achieve, but I would say the harder part is done. So going to the easier part will should be easier. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and please let me know when you see it. Um, okay. So thank you. What I showed initially was uh, this, the REPL, because this morning I got a little bit sidetracked in order to fix some of the, the offline uh, network environment that worked uh, on the, in another context. I had to fix quite a few things. And for this, I had to make the, the ability to program more efficient, let's say. Uh, so that did work. Uh, and I think it was worth it. But in fine, what the result is uh, in terms of, let's say, text files, uh, it's this. So I have my three different devices, the device I'm on, my desktop, but also the remarkable, uh, the Quest 2, the VR headset, and then the console. And what I can see from each of them is the, are the files and directory of a specific directory uh, which is home slash prototypes, which is my own personal convention, where I put things I, I want to work on, uh, and it's stuff I'm going to build or I'm building. Um, and the goal for this is to be reusable. So it's usually code and data. Uh, and the, the, the goal of this is like, maybe I'm never going to use it twice. Maybe it's part of my workflow, but it's not one tool on its own. The problem is, as you can see, I have a bunch of devices. So the idea was, can I have a workspace with the different prototypes and combine them? Uh, and then to bring this into VR, so I push this back into my usual uh, work environment. Uh, some of this you might know, uh, some of the physics, some of the in VR programming. But what's new, and I, I understand that visually it's not particularly pretty, uh, all those three columns here, the first, the second, and the third. Uh, and those are, as you might see here, uh, Antwerp, EPUB, Template. Uh, there is the, the EPUB there, I think, somewhere from Andy Clark. Yeah, oh, just it's hard on the desktop to show itself straight backward. Uh, Andy Clark, the experience machine that was here just uh, earlier this morning. And it's the actual file. You see the EPUB at the end. Uh, and that's the same data as this one. Uh, if I was in the headset, I could grab it, like pinch the beginning of the line to move it around, change the organization. Instead of being three columns, it could be whatever I want. Uh, it could be a cube also uh, to give a shape to this thing. Uh, and eventually, if it's an EPUB or a text or, or code, some JavaScript, some known uh, file system, I haven't done this, but the goal would be, for example, to, uh, well, I could relatively easily load it there. If it's uh, an image, I could just show it, a 3D model, same. Uh, if it's something else to interpret or to highlight, I could put this in this text editor. But yeah, basically, that's a unified workspace of the different subdirectories of the three different devices that I can interact with uh, in VR. Voilà. That's amazing. I love it. That, that Thank you. That's really extraordinary. I feel like you need a promo video with like a lot of animation so that people can <laughs> can like really follow like okay, this column like put the e-reader next to it and this column put a picture of the you know the device. I feel like that's kind of what's missing because if the people miss that sentence uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you end up talking for a long time and it's hard to but like yeah like I feel like you need the pictogram next to those columns 
so I, I, I uh, agree with this. I had done a prototype in the past. I don't have it here where I use my chair here. So I'm rolling back a bit. And on the chair, I had put uh, an accelerometer uh, and I had the known position of my desktop, uh, my laptop, my remarkable. And basically it would highlight the device that was facing. And in order to show this, I had, as you say, the photo of the device yeah. I'm looking at. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively confident that is not a hard part. Um, and what I do, I have um, uh, the list of devices is dynamic, but it's also based on the SSH file. So that's a low level protocol to control different devices. And that, what I did is I hijacked the configuration format to say, for example, the, the home directory is a little bit special, it's there. So what I could do is hijack uh, to say, okay, each device has an icon or, or an image that represents it, or a 3D model, a GLTF file, so that it, you can grab it more easily when you're in VR, uh, and should be, let's say, at the top of the column or the side of the column or whatever uh, format you want. So, thanks. That does make sense. Yeah, I, I think that's there. extraordinary. I love it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I have three things. Number one, why is it, and it's, it's a real and genuine question, why is it that people who are incredibly technically sav uh, savvy, like purple, hardly anyone else does, because you have a lot of purple in there. And I, and I was thinking, it is a bit of a cyberpunk thing, but like Ted Nelson, Zig Zaglow was purple and red. No one else uses purple. It, it may be on fashion runways, but you will, because we talked about the two flower things earlier, you know, I thought it would be an no interesting design. <laughs> no, but is there maybe, because I remember asking my father many, many years ago, we're looking at something and I said, you know, do you see it plain or there's, is there a bit of noise, you know, like floaters? He did not notice the floaters. I noticed the floaters, you know, so maybe even in the way we perceive colors, there is an emotion, especially when we choose to project it. Of course, there's a lot of color theory, but anyway, um, for these directories, does Dropbox and that type of thing factor into it? Or, or are they physical devices? Because if there's Dropbox, I can use it too. Yeah, so uh, it could be uh, because if you remember at the beginning of the day, I showed a, a web dev directory with some of the um, file, including uh, the quote uh, from Mavetic. Um, so it, 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 it is the same. Uh, Kind of thing. I don't want to focus on it first because the goal is to be independent and reliable. So if I do it, and let's say Dropbox first or Internet first, yeah, it's going to interest more people, but I don't think it's going to be as resilient and private. Uh, that being said, it's the same kind of mechanism. You can uh, you can add yet another machine, or you can add a service like Dropbox. Ideally, it would be uh, what's the name? It would support. Uh, actual um, standards and I'm not sure Dropbox does, I'm not sure Google Drive does, they usually try to push for their own standard or implementation so I'm um, but but it, yes in theory it could be integrated and I think without too much uh, work. One one tiny thing though um, and I see the interest of it also uh, but the, the reminder let's say of this with a octopus and the different arms would be to say it should not be just about system. This is what I show here. Um, but but the vision or the, the, the idea behind it is it is both a file system with the files, but also what makes the device that hosts the file special. So for example, the ink is not VR, but it's still valuable. Um, so it would have at least a couple of functions to let's say, import or export at the bare minimum but eventually do something else. Um, so the file system, local or remote, yes. Uh, it's not just that, though. It's at least ways to be interoperable uh, and eventually just processing things that are relevant to that device to interoperate with the, interoperate with the others. I think, I think it's wonderful. Oh, I love it. I, I think you should also have a different room or a different area per device. Like, I feel like another direction rather than adding the pictogram of the device. Um, I don't know if in the space that you have, you can actually move, but you know, there are these little huts 
in that space, maybe each hut is dedicated to one of the devices. So you start to activate spatial memory. So it's like, okay, I go into this hut to pull my data from my ink device. I go into this hut here, maybe you change the color. So it's like, I go into the purple hut for the ink reader. I go into the orange hut for getting stuff out of my whatever camera. No, um, and I'm, I'm going to sound, um... Well, it's going to sound bad, but anyway, yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, it it's a bit silly to have it just as lists that are right there in front of you. Uh, it's just time wise, like I literally was able to get that port working uh, at uh, at four p.m. Um, sharp. Uh, but but yeah, I, I I I honestly don't like to show it like this because it's not really spatial. I mean, it's spatial yet meaningless. It should indeed be. Uh, either in different visually or experientiable environment. It is not a, as it uh, yet, um, but um, yeah, of, of course it, it, it must be uh, there. And also just like to, I remember what you mentioned, Andrea, a couple of uh, sessions ago about um, there is no background or the background is, yeah, here it's used uh, as a way to show rather than something to work in or even shape back. Um, but yeah, time-wise, uh, I yeah, uh, it's not something I, I managed to do. Um, but but for example, one thing that was done uh, before had been uh, to uh, shape a three D model while being in VR, uh, and the model you shape could uh, have all that content uh, binded to it or attached to it, and it would be yeah specific to that device let's say either everything else disappear or they are next to each other or you go from one to the other um but yes as is it, it's not a it's not good enough when it, it's forced to be spatial let's say rather than than actually thought through but but yes also that's that's the goal of it having like that that um to rethink how the device connect to each other relate to each other and eventually even change back the physical devices themselves but yeah, that's, that's it. No, it's not criticism at all. I think it's wonderful. I think it's just a suggestion going forward in terms of, it, it, it's, I mean, I think there are two things like usability, but also communication. I feel like if each hut had its own device and there was a picture of that device, you could even have a screenshot and everyone would kind of understand where it's going or what it is. Whereas without that, you would just need a lot of writing and videos, you know, apropos, <laughs> apropos the earlier discussion. Um, you would need a lot of text and a lot of videos and a lot of posts on social media to communicate this. And people might still kind of struggle to understand and get excited about what it does. But it, it's, like a, it's like a usability and a communication aspect that i i mean i also struggle with i i think what i do tends to be more visual but i also struggle to get the theoretical ideas in a format that uh, that can be communicated but i feel like a lot of us are in the same boat and the discussion fraud started earlier is going in the same boat it's like we are super excited about this stuff and we're like Spatial computing is going to change everything, and this is exactly what we need to be doing. But but we are, yeah, we just need to get better. Not marketing, communication. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just trying to get into your uh, world here, Fabian, while we're listening. Yeah. Usually I use the uh, hmd.link to share a link on the same, uh, let's say from desktop to, uh, to VR. You it's okay. It. I put it on our um, FTL sites. So it's really easy because that's a link that I just have. Yeah, I, yeah. I just give you a, a little warning for people here and in the video. Um, in, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes or less, I'm going to remove it. I mean, just deactivate it because it's my actual files on my actual <laughs> devices. I did check a little bit the security, but uh, not thoroughly. Um, so yeah, before it's like shared to the actual world and I haven't checked all my pass, 
words and, and SSH keys and whatnot. Uh, it's not going to stay live, it's fine point. Uh, I could make a simulation version of it, where it would be, let's say, the equivalent of fake drop boxes or fake devices. Um, but, but yeah, probably not going to bother. Um, but yeah. In terms of communication, my excuse, which is a bit lame, but is uh, even if nobody else but me uses that, I'm also okay. Uh, I, I do want genuine uh, feedback uh, and, and uh, suggestions to system and whatnot, and, and brilliant idea that would say, oh shit, that I really need to in incorporate that and implement it. So I, I know I must communicate and as well as I could. Um, my, yeah, my, my kind of excuse is like, okay, even if nobody gets it, but I can think better through my interconnected and specialized device. Yeah, that's also fine by me. But yeah, it's, it, again, it's just an excuse. <laughs> no, I think that's fair. I think, I think if we can't put aside all this burden that Rod tries to shove on us about communicating, which is completely fair, but I feel like we have to put that aside sometimes at least, otherwise it's just too heavy of a burden and we just can't get excited about things anymore. Yeah, I I could, that, that's why it's so great, the discussion we had before the break about um, you know, making it clear when we have a summary uh, at the end and things like this, I'm very grateful for that. It seems to be a, a social thing that we can actually do. Boom, entering your uh, work. You know, you know also, Frode, um, what, what you can do if you enter on AR rather than BR. Oh, okay. The content of files uh, are going to appear with your real background, let's say. Well, and if you were to be uh, in front of me and physically align, let's say, the remarkable uh, quest uh, and uh, the Steam Deck, because that's what I use, their content would be on top of them. It would be the same. Uh, the files and the device they are from would be roughly uh, spatially aligned. You have a lot of city noise in the background. That may not be necessary, but everything else is amazing. I am now in the AR view, and yeah, this is super cool. I mean, like soft space is really fantastic also, but it's great how different they are. In soft space, it's lots of things like this. Here you have defined chunks. It makes it uh, Spaka special. Is anyone else going on headset for this? It's so cool, guys. Right, yes, that was not a diversion. That was the actual work we're doing, FYI. That was super cool. One, uh, one tiny detail then, and, and then I'll, I'll stop entirely. On the environment that you experienced, Frode, and that I showed before, there is this text editor. Uh, I, why did I leave it here? Whereas it's not uh, entirely relevant to, uh, to displaying those files from the different devices is because one of the constraints I try to give myself is that uh, you need to be able to reprogram from the device you're on. So that means that if you're uh, in VR looking at the files, for example, uh, managing from one device to the other, and you say, oh, I want, for example, to implement what Andrea said. The goal is not to remove the headset uh, so that you say, I have the idea right there. I was in the headset when she said it. I want to try it now. Uh, and so that I don't go back and forth, that I keep the affordance that are native to the device. And it's the same as with the phone, for example. Uh, I want to be able to edit the code from right here, not, uh, not go to the desktop and code and uh, push and try in, in a way that the interactions are completely different. So that's why the, the code editor remained for that example, uh, or for, to show for the demo is with the hope that uh, it's a responsive programming setup. It's not just responsive to consume the content, it's also to shape back uh, how it is. Yeah. So I'm pretending to go on a tangent here. I'm not. We are on track for you and Andrea, but this is a really important question. In a month, Apple's headset will come out. Apparently, it'll be two times 4K. Some people call it 8K. Of course, it isn't. But the, the visual quality is going to be astounding. It's going to have lots of pros and cons, and it's going to be owned by corporation. That's the key issue for us, right? With the incredible stuff that the two of you have made and some of the experiments of Randall, 
let's say we decided now, I'm forcing this upon you purely as a thought experiment, that within two months together, with some of us working in the flat world, how can we make an experience where you put on your headset, your work is there, which is what you've been doing now, Fabian, and you can actually do something with it, take your headset off and continue with it. And no, this is not a visual meta thing at all, right? But it seems, I mean, the, the reason I don't recommend anyone work in the headset unless it's for gaming sports or they actually do architecture where they need it for their job. How the heck do you do work in there? Can a group like us solve some of that? Can we provide one experience where we say, for instance, oh, you want to write in a peaceful environment? Yes, use this. The screen, you know, taking the computer screen in is nice, but it's over there. Or a data visualization, or a storytelling, or a viewing experience. Can we do it? So, so could we do uh, it if we decided to? Sorry, could we do it? No, but I, I, I mean, I'm not the only one, but I've done this. Like, for example, the environment I show with the text editor, I coded it on the plane. I mean, not the whole thing, but some of it on the plane. And not, not to prove a point, not to say, oh, I did it because I must. Uh, it's because it works. Like, it, it is, there are so many kinks to iron out. It is so bad in so many ways. So I'm not doing this all the time. Like, today, I did not do it. Um, but I, I've done it in the plane, genuinely enjoying it because I'm uh, I'm just in flow. I'm just focused on the thing. Like I have the noise cancelling headphones. I'm in a world that is not the world I'm in, and I shape it back so I have the sense of agency. Um, so it, it's definitely possible. So work in general, I don't know, and I I don't think so. It really depends on the kind of work you do. But programming, spatially or not, actually, uh, in the headset and in that environment, for example, I showed. It's not, let's say, in two months or in two weeks that works today. It's not for everyone, um, but I, I generally enjoyed it because you're in there, you do the thing, and it's it's a relatively fast iteration process. Yeah. How would, how long would it take for a friend who is a competent programmer to be able to start using that environment for their own work? 